Hello, uh, welcome and thank you for coming. We continue the North Seattle College Art Gallery's virtual visual artist lecture series that we started in the fall of 2020. Today we have an artist lecture by Florida-based printmaker and installation artist, Jakob Reyes. I'm Amanda Knowles, the coordinator of the NSC Art Gallery and printmaking and drawing instructor in the art department at North Seattle College. I'm pleased to work with Karen Stuldreyer, who assists in the gallery, does a lot of work on social media and is assisting behind the scenes here today. We have live transcript available for those of you who want it. Uh, those of you who don't want it or find it distracting, you can turn it off by clicking the carrot uh, next to the live transcript button at the bottom of the Zoom screen and selecting hide subtitle. Use it if you wish, hide it if you wish, but we wanna be sure that we have it there for those who need it. Uh, so uh, I will start with some acknowledgements. So I'm gonna share my screen. First is the land acknowledgement. North Seattle College acknowledges that we occupy the lands of the Coast Salish peoples, the descendants of the first peoples of this region, a people whose cultures endure and are valued. Without this land and these cultures, we would not have access to this gathering, dialogue, and learning space. We take this moment to honor and thank the original caretakers of this land, their ancestors, and their descendants who are still here. We encourage participants here today to consider our responsibilities as we stand in solidarity with the sovereignty, cultural heritage, and lives of indigenous, native, and First Nations peoples. I'm also going to do a labor acknowledgement. We also pause to recognize and acknowledge the labor that created the United States and from which we all benefit. We remember that our nation is built on the labor of enslaved people who were forcibly brought to the United States from the African continent, and we recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We acknowledge immigrant labor and recognize that voluntary forced and prison labor contribute to the building and ongoing maintenance of our nation. We acknowledge all unpaid caregiving labor. Additionally, we acknowledge the critical importance of the work towards racial equity that continues across this country and, and elsewhere in response to racial injustice and generations of structural racism against BIPOC communities. And then our third slide uh, shows what we are doing to continue to work to go from acknowledgement to deed. Uh, we know that it's not enough to just acknowledge the land and labor and have to be sure that we are taking action. We show you here what actions North Seattle College and the NSC Art Department are taking to support BIPOC individuals and institutions and to be held accountable. We recommend Real Rent Duwamish and we will put that link in the chat for you to explore. Thank you. The NSC Art Gallery is currently showing the 2021-2022 NSC juried student art exhibitions. We are extremely proud of all of our students and love how this show came together. The NSC Art Gallery is open Monday through Thursday, 11 to four through June 16th. We hope you see the show in the gallery soon. And while you are there, if it's before May 31st, be sure to cast your vote on People's uh, Choice Award as there will be an award ceremony uh, in the NSA Art Gallery on Wednesday, June 1st from 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. This will also be an opportunity to hear students talk about their work. We continue to mandate the campus wellness check-in and highly recommend the wearing of masks. The NSC uh, continuing education exhibition is also the next exhibition that's coming. It opens on July 19th. Um, during the regular school year, fall through spring, we will continue to have virtual vi visiting artist lectures and are in the planning stages for next year's virtual, virtual visiting artists. Today is the final visiting artist lecture of the 2021-2022 school year. Please keep checking in with the gallery on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website to find out what is going on in our programming. We urge you to visit our website for links to recordings of all the talks to date, as well as what is next. We, we will post our links in the chat. Um, so thank you. And with that, it's time to introduce you to our visiting artist, Jakob Reyes. Jakob is a Florida-based printmaker, installation artist, and educator. Uh, Jakob finds and makes materials and tools to use in his practice. He carves detailed large-scale narrative woodcuts based 
on the acculturation of the Caribbean. Jacob Reyes holds a BFA in drawing and printmaking from the University of Central Florida. Reyes holds workshops independently in the community. He is a recipient of the Foundation for Contemporary Arts Emergency Grant, the Puffin Foundation, the Pew Collective Grant, Allies in Arts Grant, Artist Relief Grant, Immersive Art Artist Grant, Awesome Grant, and uh, Southern Graphics International gr Grant, and the J.R. Hopes Scholarship. And I'm sure there are a million more things that he has grants for. I know a couple um, also additional. His work is held in several public and private collections, including Mass Art, the Morgan Conservatory, the uh, University of Central Florida, Frontera Gal Gal Galleria Urbana, the City of Orlando's Public Art Collection and Hoop Snake Press. He has exhibited regionally, nationally, and internationally. Notable exhibitions include the International Print Center in New York, uh, Umbria, New Prints for a Dark Age, juried by Alison Saar, Arte Insurgente, uh, Tres Gatos Press Residency and Installation in Guadalajara, Mexico, Southern Graphics Conference International's El Encuentro Beach Installation in San Juan, Puerto Rico. That keeps being pushed back. I believe that's gonna be 2025 now. Um, and Paper West, juried by uh, Willie Cole. Jacob Reyes will be in the Seattle area for eight days in August and September for an uh, outdoor print demonstration that will be open to the public as well as workshops and a large collaborative mural with the community in the area. Jakob will be printing an edition while here with Sheila Coppola of Sidereal Press, who is in the audience, and will be hosting this visit. Um, I hope that some of you are able to sign up for some of these events, and I'm sure uh, we'll hear a little bit more about that. I will hand you over to Jakob, but before I do, I want to let the audience know that we will be taking questions as usual uh, in the chat today. So if questions or comments arise during the talk, please write them in the chat and we will hopefully get to all of them. As usual, we'll be sending a transcript of the chat to Jakob after the talk. So if you want to comment on the work and his words, please do, but you might be specific about what you're commenting on as he will see your words after the talk but I urge you to support Jakob and his work in the chat. Welcome virtually to Seattle. <laughs> and thank you so much for coming to speak with us, Jakob. Yes, thank you. I am uh, reporting from the future because over here it's three o'clock <laughs> and, and where you are, it's 12. So, um, but yeah, thank you, Amanda, Sheila, and Karen for all your help, um, you know, for having me. Uh, I definitely appreciate it and obviously, um, I'm thankful for, you know, the Duwamish tribe for, you know, letting us uh, borrow their land and hopefully we can actually give back, you know, um, and I'm hoping for their, uh, you know, to be federally recognized, you know, hopefully. So definitely go out and sign those petitions and uh, help to, you know, work alongside them so that we can actually have an equitable space where people can be recognized so um you know deib work is very uh, gritty you know it's on on the ground work and and we all have to work towards it you know with the help of allies and and everything else um and thank you all for coming uh i appreciate it and hopefully um we can learn from each other you know from this presentation and i my Instagram and email is always open for any questions after this. Yeah, definitely. Let's uh, keep our conversations going. So I'm always available and accessible to you all. Right now, I'm going to share my screen and I'll start my presentation. That's going to touch on some of the work that I've been doing. So this is one of the woodcuts that I did in the background. It's, it shows two Taino native people, which are, you know, my ancestors from Puerto Rico, and they're kind of embracing in a, in a canoe, and the outline is a, a butterfly. So I thought that would be a, a nice uh, image to intro my work, because that kind of encapsulates everything that, you know, I try to show, which is nature, connection with my ancestors, and um, uh, reclaimed wood. That's why it's kind of an interesting shape. 
here's some a little blurb about me. As Amanda already said, I'm based in the greater Miami area and I use tools that I make and materials that I find to carve these woodcuts. Um, sometimes they're linoleum because when people do their new construction in houses and stuff, they rip out the flooring. So construction sites are definitely my favorite places to go. <laughs> um, if you wanna do this, definitely have gloves and boots and some more protect, protective you know, gear, like first aid kits. <laughs> Because uh, there's there's a lot of things uh, that people throw out that you know you're probably not supposed to be touching. So um, that that's kind of how I start my my images. Is uh, that's where my process starts is is sourcing these found materials, and then those kind of inform what kind of image I can put on those. So um, a lot of my work is organically shaped because. There's a lot of wood that I find that is uh, molded or damaged. So they come out kind of wonky, you know, after the jigsaw. And then I, I kind of uh, get my, you know, um, sketchbook. And my sketchbook is usually just lists of things that inspire me. Let's say an example of that would be like, you know, um, the sun was hitting a cream wall and that color stood out to me. So I try to connect words with like the images and that process helps me to make images onto this you know kind of decrepit wood here um, is one of the prints that i did when i uh, participated in big ink in atlanta so this was quite large this was like an eight foot woodcut and i wanted to kind of i pulled inspiration from albert Durer. And I wanted to kind of redefine the image of Adam and Eve. So I used like these native uh, looking peoples to work off of that, usually whitewashed Christian imagery. And that's um, kind of what I was doing in my earlier work was addressing religion and my upbringing. So I kind of have like a very complicated uh, childhood that actually, like I, I grew up, you know, Muslim, I grew up Catholic, and then that moved to Baptist, and then that moved into non-denominational. So religion was a, really a big part in my life, but it was also kind of confusing. So to put it in the context of, you know, black and brown people, and, and how the, you know, the Bible or religion would look in that context was something that I was drawn to and interested in exploring. So this is kind of like uh, older imagery, but I still think that it's it's relevant to me. You know, it's not necessarily what I'm exploring today, but I I, I think it's a it was an interesting um, topic to look at. So with this woodcut, I actually cut it into threes, and you can see the the top half is one block, the middle is another, and then the legs are the final block. And that's how I was able to transport it in such a small car and drive all the way up to Atlanta and then put piece it all together after it was inked and then run it through that pretty monumental press that Lyle um, brings across the country. So, um, so here is a, uh, this is a couple of videos that I took um, today that shows, you know, the studio that I work in it's, I, I made it kind of quick because uh, it's a working studio. So there's a lot of stuff everywhere. And it's also a communal space. So you can kind of see this is a collaborative mural that we're working on. And here are some woodcuts that I recently completed. So just to give you a little look into my daily studio practice. And I'm super grateful to have this studio. It's actually part of this year long residency that I have here in South Florida uh, through American Landmark. And they're a pretty large apartment complex and they've afforded me, you know, this pretty large studio along with like an apartment. So I'm pretty grateful for that. So it gives me the freedom to create and hold classes and have studio visits, so. I'm definitely grateful for that. 
here's some of my work that I that I completed in December in the uh, Shinnecock Indian Nation. I was invited through their BIPOC artists in residence and I came with a very general idea of what I wanted to create and it just kind of you know stemmed from there. I really enjoy like site-specific areas and I try to respond and immerse myself in those areas you know listening to the people's stories listening to what the land is like saying and and what the what the surrounding area is saying so I try to do a pretty decent job with like recording a lot of my process and that's why Instagram is kind of an extension of my art practice it's like documenting you know the things that I do so it, when I was there for instance I was uh you know recording myself you know taking bike rides to Cooper's Beach and and um collecting uh rocks and and seashells and and different like kind of uh artifacts that I that I compiled and and uh kind of created that gallery show out of all the found objects that I would just find around the reservation so basically right before this residency i had that npr podcast going science fridays i don't know if you 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 all heard of that yeah it's one of my favorite shows and um i happened to be at a residency in tennessee so i just had that kind of playing from my phone and i was you know making these woodcuts um these circular woodcuts uh responding to like you know how the earth looked before us, during us, and at, long after us. So Irma actually was interviewing uh, Tila Troch, um, who is one of the indigenous women that started uh, the Shinnecock Kelp Farmers uh, Initiative. So it was so, you know, kind of serendipitous that I just had this podcast playing and, and it was about, you know, the area that I was going to in the next coming months, you know? Um, so I immediately got on the internet and, and, you know, emailed them, you know, hit their face, Facebook and Instagram and nothing happened, <laughs> you know? Um, so I wasn't able to get in contact with them. And then I, I, you know, I was messaging Jeremy. He's an amazing photographer, um, that runs that program. It's called Ma's house. And he actually redid his grandma's house and, he's transforming it into this residency so he's doing really great stuff and I was like I need to get in contact with Tila and at the time I didn't know that they were you know basically relatives you know so he's like oh yeah like you know I, I can just send her a message and you know whatever and um so I guess it all trickled down and I was able to meet them and actually visit the the kelp farm where they're growing sea kelp from like a micro level you know they have like these spools and in water and they 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 have you know um, microscopes and they're looking at at the uh, organisms you know at a mic microscopic level and cultivating this kelp which is super important for their environment because um the south Hamptons is just riddled with mansions and those mansions use a lot of fertilizer to upkeep their gardens you know which is a very ironic idea you know because you know having this like huge nature with a, a mansion on it but it's actually destroying the nature in the surrounding areas so all this runoff would go into the Shinnecock Bay and and it's uh it's destroying their ecosystem you know uh fish don't want to live there the uh, you know, oysters and shellfish are leaving. And th that's really the main uh, water filter. But, you know, the, the amount of fertilizer being used and the amount of time that it's needed for the earth to repair itself is just disproportionate, you know? So the earth never gets the chance to catch up. <laughs> and, and that's really detrimental to that, to, to the environment. So what they're doing is they're actually you know, using this kelp to clean the water. And then they're going to harvest the kelp and dry it and use it as fertilizer for those mansions. 
So it, it's just, it's a really well thought out plan. And I, I think it's amazing. So, you know, I, I wanted to just pay homage to those amazing women that stepped up and they're doing, you know, amazing work along with raising kids and working full time and, and, you know, all that. So I made this mural to commemorate what they're doing. And um, it's made out of a woodcut that I, that I made there out of the sea kelp. And then I used that image and modeled it after the woman. And, uh, and then I just kind of found this shed on the property. And I was like, that's exactly where I want to put this image. It was just like, kind of like, uh, I think it was like 20 degrees some days. So it was very cold. The days weren't very long. So sometimes I would have to start at 9 a.m. and then end like at 3 p.m. because it would already start getting dark, you know, because this was in December. So it was not only cold, it was rainy, you know, not took so much time to work. And basically the place where I picked, you know, this shed, um, basically when you step down or move something, uh, it looks like the thing that you moved is like twitching. And just to, just to give you, you know, why that happened was that I was surrounded by ticks. <laughs> so when I moved like my chair, it would all like just jump off and move and everything. <laughs> so I, that was a, you know, tick infested area that I chose, but it was, I think it was too cold for them to really do anything. But that kind of shows, you know, the extent of what I do to create my work. Um, so that was an interesting part of the process and um, just kind of working around those kind of uh, difficult spaces. But I learned a lot about painting and, and transferring the image and, and all that. And I'm glad that I can do such a small part to give back, you know, and hopefully uh, help grow the residency and, and stuff like that. So here is a... Um, segment of another community project that I did. And this was in Mexico. I was, I was kind of thinking of the relevancy of patterns. So a lot of like European cloths that I find and use in my work are very heavy pattern based. So that was kind of the prompt that we worked off of. So we uh, made woodcuts and the people that went to the workshop were able to you know, contribute to this larger than life woodblock wheat paste mural installation. So this was a kind of interesting uh, cutout in the wall. And we just, uh, we did a pattern that is all the same size and kind of patchworked it into that. And it came out really awesome. I mean, it's one of my favorite um, collaborative pieces, definitely. And this was an interesting project too, because it was kind of, in part with like a print and draw kind of activity. And I encouraged the participants, you know, to try different techniques in printing. So we did have a press on hand, but I was like, you know, in my process, I don't have a press, you know, because a lot of my woodcuts are, are large and I just prefer doing things by hand. So I told one of the students to take the, their uh, bottle of whatever they were drinking and try to print with that. And uh, they were actually able to, to print with it. <laughs> so um, just kind of collaborating and try, trying to kind of brainstorm ways where we can still get to an outcome is kind of what I, what I love to do. It's uh, just like how this works, like piecing together a puzzle. That was really cool. And then I've also been able to, you know, collaborate with internationally known artists I was able to bring this artist, Killjoy, out to create a mural in our local community. And she taught me a lot too, because this was one of my first murals. So, you know, she was like giving me pointers and, and stuff like that. So I'm not really a painter by trade, but I'm, I'm learning because uh, as a printmaker, you kind of have to be everything and nothing all at once. <laughs> so a master of none, that's for sure. This is another public work that was commissioned by the city of Sanford. 
what I'm doing now with my public work is, you know, bringing it out of the studio, you know, and into real life. So this was a cool little, you know, utility box project where they printed out my, you know, woodcut, you know, onto this. But um, right now I'm currently the artistic director for an eco park where I'm going to take uh, woodcuts like this and kind of, you know, put them into the uh, accessible sidewalks and onto signage where people can do like rubbings of, you know, my work and learn more about like the native nature in that area. So I think that's, you know, something that I never would have thought as I started, you know, printmaking journey. I never thought that I can extend it past paper or, or you know, just kind of like static images, 2D images on a wall. So this is a really exciting evolution in my work where it continues to grow without the use of machinery. You know, presses are such an important part of that quick dissemination of information. But, you know, the fact that I can just, you know, leave a couple of graphite sticks and a kind of raised you know, 3D printed image of my woodcut and people can come up and make their own rubbings. I mean, it's totally regressive and progressive at the same time, you know? So I like that dichotomy and, you know, just making things accessible for people. So they're able to take their own art, you know, with them just from going to a park. So I hope it sparks curiosity and uh, helps people explore expand their their ideas of art making in general you know so this is a series that i started at the beginning of covid i use my art to kind of like decode who i am and, and it sounds so cliche and like personal or you know but I've, I've always had these like mixed emotions about like myself as a person i grew up you know in a household that was divided and it was like going back and forth from you know different family members and and different parents and and having that you know mixed experience that's really what my work is about is that mixed identity experience so I didn't really have like a religion to call my own I didn't have a space to call my own I didn't have even my name you know I mean for the longest time my dad would call me Yakub and my mom would call me Jacob. So as I continued to grow and it was really difficult because I was in, I think, fifth grade when 9-11 happened. And that was really difficult because, you know, I was already growing a beard at age 16 or 15, basically. So growing up in like a post 9-11 era, it was, it was difficult because not only the way that I looked, because a lot of kids would, you know, call me terrorist and other things like that, which, which didn't help me claim the fact that I was half Pakistani, you know, like I always wanted to lean more into the Caribbean aspect where I was like, oh, no, I'm just, you know, Puerto Rican and Cuban, you know, and I just left it at that because the demographics in the area where I grew up was more Hispanic and Black. And, and white than kind of mixed race. So after college, I was like, you know, I, I wanna like dig deep and kind of accept these parts that I've, I've been told to forget or move on from or, or, or not claim. And that was difficult because I was trying to associate with the, the only family that I really knew, you know, and, um, and really claim that, but to go back and, and use that power to claim things within myself was tough. And that's basically what this series is about. It's like looking at my experience, not being really accepted by, you know, my Caribbean family because I wasn't, you know, purebred Puerto Rican, you know, whatever that might mean, or a purebred Cuban or a purebred, you know, I was the culmination of these different cultures from all around the world, you know? Um, so what I did was I took those experiences and I applied it to the theme of colonialism and also the theme of native and invasive species, because as you can 
see uh, religious work is not universally palpable. So a lot of people have very strong ties to religion and it's very difficult to talk about. It's up there with like politics, you know? So I knew that my work was, uh, it was abrasive. It was in your face. And I wanted to create something that was more uh, universal that a lot of people could understand. And if they wanted to learn more, they can read more about. So this image that we see here is a, it's a coffee, it's a coffee plant and then a coral ardasia. So one is native and one is invasive. And the invasive one is actually poisonous, while the native one is edible. So it's interesting how close they look. So I wanted to kind of use that and expand on the idea of colonialism because, you know, when Europeans brought enslaved people to the Caribbean and also parts of the U.S., there was a natural mixing that occurred, right? So now we have, you know, people like me or, you know, Afro-Cuban or, you know, uh, Tainos with Europeans. Like there was all different sorts of mixing and people started to look different, but also the same, but also like share the same culture, you know, which was really interesting, that evolution. And um, that's kind of what I'm like, portraying in these pieces is like just that emergence it's always the emergence of those cultures and creating like basically a new culture out of that just like the religion you know we had catholicism uh, merge with voodoo and then when they came into the caribbean it basically made santeria which uses catholic imagery but uses the voodoo gods essentially so this is another piece, it's called Guidance, and it's a uh, fountain grass and water hyacinth. So water hyacinth, you know, looks really beautiful. It's a, uh, it has a uh, basically like lily pads on the tops of uh, lakes and stuff, but it actually doesn't allow the light to go to the bottom and feed the, the bottom vegetation. So a lot of lakes actually, you know, die because of water hyacinth. And it's a really beautiful, almost like lotus-like purple flower. So I have this kind of, it has tension with the fountain grass, which is uh, native grass around the banks of, of um, ponds and lakes as well. So the crossover basically is like, you know, these, these were kind of like battles that I was also fighting within my own blood inside me. You know, I, w I was dealing with, all these, you know, like it says, emotional stripes. And, and those are what, that's what people that have faced colonialism also, it's like a unifying, like shared experience, you know, where it's like, you know, do I love these people? Do I hate them? Do I want to, you know, destroy them? Because I've seen so much destruction that I've endured, you know, it's it's that very complex relationship that happens internally and then in the actual real world externally where these things are tangible you know the mass genocide and disease and ecocide you know that we see long after those kind of ripple effects and the constant just oppression of people and and advantage you know taken um over people so I had like a similar thing happening within, you know, myself, you know, like what name do I claim? You know, what, who do I, you know, what group do I belong to? So I think this series definitely encapsulates, you know, not only my personal experience, but experiences that my family and my ancestors have had. So, so here's the kind of uh, size of the prints that I create out of the found wood. So this is a woodblock print on linen. And I am going to show you some videos on some of the process. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
So I'm using Japanese chisels to carve out these, uh, these designs that I make on the wood. So what I do is I, um, I kind of tape off the, the outside of the organic woodcut. And I, that's how I plan how it's going to fall on the piece of fabric. So you can see kind of just like little tape marks, just so that I know where to put the block every single time. But keep in mind that this takes about, you know, two weeks to a month to carve. And then just the inking and setting up everything. And I have a dog that sheds. So, <laughs> you know, I have to kind of, uh, you know, sweep and mop and, and, and make sure everything's clean. And then I, I set the, the block down, tape it off, then tape off the fabric. And then it takes about an hour and a half to ink because I have a small roller. <laughs> and then it also takes about an hour to print, you know? And it's all by hand with a, something that's called a, a baron. So you can kind of see me inking the surface and more or less I know what it's going to look like because I use marker for the lines. So that definitely helps. But with printmaking, everything's a surprise sometimes. <laughs> so. so this is using oil-based ink that can be washed with soap and water. Speedball has been good to me and they've accepted me into their pro professional artist network. So um, I've been using the, um, you know, the Speedball black graphic ink. This is how it looks when it's all inked up. So all those details kind of pop. And um, right now I'm looking for, you know, like a particular shine. So you want it to kind of be shiny all over so that you get like a punchy print and you kind of have to, you know, mind your edges and, and make sure that, you know, certain areas stay clean. So I kind of take, you know, a Q-tip and, and wipe some areas and make sure that it's ready to print. But you want to kind of work quickly throughout this whole process because you don't want like little hairs to land on it and weird stuff happens when you're so close to the floor, so. All right, and then um, this is kind of like, you know, the planning stage. This was, I like making little teaser videos too. So what I did was I measured the, the fabric and then this is me um, printing all by hand. So I use a piece of paper in between the fabric so that it doesn't move and that my hand can just kind of glide over that. So this is a little sped up process. And this fabric is actually one of the thickest fabrics that I've printed on. It's like this raw linen. So that was pretty, pretty difficult. But uh, you can actually see the image through the textile, which makes it a little bit easier to know uh, if you missed an area or not. But Unfortunately, with, uh, without a press, you can't really like lift things up and put it down like you would usually uh, be able to do. So this is kind of like a cross your fingers and, and pray kind of <laughs> deal every single time. Like, I hope this comes out. Yeah, definitely in printmaking, you have to be okay with failure. I think <laughs> that also works in life too, you know. Um, I've definitely sent out, you know, 300 applications and then you get one that says, okay, you can join us, you know? So that's kind of just like how life is as an artist, rolling with the punches. <laughs> so that was some of the background videos. And this is uh, some up close images of, of how detailed you can get with different types of wood. So this wood is super easy to use. It's called MDF. It doesn't really have a grain but you do have to be careful to keep your tools sharp because it, it's basically like you're cutting through congealed sawdust. <laughs> so your, uh, your tools get really dull.
Um, here's some more designs. Uh, the one in the middle is almost done, but what I do is I draft my designs up on an iPad and then I either blast it onto the wood block with a projector or I just transfer it um, the old school way, which is like printing them all out and then um, transferring it with graphite. So that's how I get these uh, big images onto the wood. And uh, here, here's a, a workshop that I did with the Shinnecock peoples. Um, so this just shows kind of like, um, you know, what you can do with the public and uh, sharing techniques so that you, you, you know, so that I'm able to empower people to take these techniques and continue to use them, you know. This is a picture of me working on the mural in Shinnecock Nation. Yeah, I, I, I love to make my work and my, um, my process accessible. That's why I think that I've leaned so um, far into the, the digital you know, web is that anyone can come up on my page and, and learn something. And, and I'm there freely teach, teaching people what I do, you know? Um, so that kind of has expanded my, my reach and, and, and has been able to, you know, take down those barriers and, and the mysticism behind art making. So I think that's really important. And um, I've taught for over 10 years and it has been from ages, I think one of, one of the students that I have now is age three believe it or not. So age three to about 80 something, you know, throughout all the years. So I, I've had such a, I've, I've definitely been blessed to, you know, work with so many people and, and just kind of hear what they say while they're creating work. You know, that's, that's some of the most moving things that I've experienced is like, just these, you know, kind of like little musings or, or little, you know, comments that people are experiencing while they're creating work. And, and that has been probably the most rewarding and the most eye-opening because it not only shows me what I lack in my own process, but what I can also apply in my own process. And it also helps me learn what I can do to further connect with people through teaching, you know? So, and then also explaining my process. For the longest time, you know, when I was a student, I. I didn't even know that you had to talk about work. I thought you could just make art and then you just, you know, right off into the horizon <laughs> and everything's going to be all right. But, you know, a lot of times, you know, visually, you, you, you know, your work doesn't get you to where you think it would, which is why now I've, I've been, you know, crafting my writing and, and really working towards that. And, and that's another extension of my practice now. It's been really awesome. These are some more uh, photos of workshops and, and the uh, massive uh, woodblock wheat paste mural. That's only a portion of it. And you can kind of see the fabric right below the, the Frontera Galeria sign. So that was like a European pattern and we printed it on cloth and then I hammered the cloth into the side of the building. <laughs> so it was like also like a 3D addition to the uh, kind of story. And the interesting part is that, so I was using religion again. So these are the three crosses, but the, the people on the inside, I actually took inspiration from where smallpox affects the human body. So those are the people that are kind of floating there but they also kind of look like people in a shooting range. So it, it's all kind of like culminating with, you know, the mass genocide and, and you know, like um, the attack on, on different cultures. And then um, the fabric part is the transference of disease through fabric. So that's kind of what's represented there. And then these um, kind of like heads in a pyramid are the uh, Santeria God Elegua. And the interesting part about this, this uh, installation is that it's at a four-way stop, basically. And Elegua is the deity of the crossroads. So that just kind of worked out perfectly. 
And not only that, this sits kind of catty corner to a huge Catholic church, <laughs> which I did not know. <laughs> but um, it was really interesting because the people that would walk by while we were, you know, kind of pasting this up would actually engage and, and you know, talk about the, the different aspects of colonialism within their own area. You know, in Mexico, they have a lot of uh, colonial architecture and obviously the churches. But then when you go into the markets, you see uh, rows and rows and rows of like, you know, viper venom and, and you know, this type of like, you know, soap and, and like things that are from Santeria, you know, like basically like markets that are like botanicas. So that's really interesting to see that this this i you know this uh theme of colonialism like really is shown across the world across so many people you know because you have the spaniard influence in mexico but they're also native people you know that continue their their heritage long after and just kind of all that influence so it was interesting to go to different places that aren't in the caribbean and still connect with people on this theme so this is some more you know workshop projects screen printing and working with different high schoolers at magnet schools these are some workshop videos let me play where i've been able to help artists like achieve you know a vision for a screen print uh, which has been really amazing to work with so many different local artists and um, help them kind of like learn a new medium that's accessible to them. The top left was Leandria. She was making little corrections to her hand-painted screen print. This is kind of flooding the screen, getting ready to uh, wash out. And this is Ivan additioning his prints. So Ivan is actually part of the Carlos Raimundi prize. So that's pretty fun that he's able to show in museums and stuff now. So that was, that's great. And um, part of my residency here is that, you know, I engage the community usually two to three times a week. And you can kind of see different things that we've done, the, the co collaborative mural, field trips to museums and building a community library where it's like a take one, leave one kind of thing. So here's some more videos in the studio. Kind of uh, showing the extent. That's the little three-year-old <laughs> in the middle. And uh, yeah. This kind of merging art, you know, therapy, design, and uh, kind of just bridging that gap between, uh, you know, academia and accessibility, you know, breaking down those walls and, and decolonizing education and, and uh, just trying to instill like a sense of inspiration and curiosity because, you know, the three-year-old has taught me to like stay curious about everything you know like like nothing is boring if if you're bored then you're just a boring person you know because because where we sit and what we see is everything's amazing so i think that's also what printmaking has taught me is like you know how can i look at those gray areas and, and push them farther so that they either turn black or white or how can i turn those black and white areas and make them gray you know so it's, it's just, it's been an interesting journey so far and, and I'm looking forward to the portfolio that I'm gonna create at the University of California, San Francisco, responding to their Japanese woodblock prints in their collection and, and uh, Alfred University. Uh, I'm gonna do a couple of found object works, uh, part of their BIPOC residency and, and uh, stuff like that. And obviously in Seattle with Sidereal Press with Sheila. We're going to be doing like huge woodblock workshops, actually multiple workshops, and um, where you can learn how to, you know, carve and, and print large. And uh, 
you know, the whole process behind that. So it's going to be really great through all those, through all those projects, I'll be able to connect with the local community and see uh, what they're passionate about, what, what they draw inspiration from and, and what makes them, them, you know? So uh, I'm definitely looking forward to um, collaborating with everyone and seeing what they create. So I hope to see everyone out at uh, our workshops. Yeah, I'm definitely excited, especially because we're going to um, also collaborate with the Duwamish tribe. So we will keep you posted. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I love your community mindedness, your community involvement and your uh, ability to uh, make art accessible to everyone. I think that that is just a lovely thing. Um, I have a couple questions. Is that okay? Is sure. that a good time? Cool. If it's Thank all right you. with everyone else. <laughs> Great. Maybe we can stop your uh, screen sharing so that we can see all, everybody's faces. There was a question um, in the, the chat. Can you talk about more about Speedball's professional network and what sponsorship is like in the art world? Of course, we, we know that from sports and what that looks like. Um, how would you encourage students or any artist to reach out to brands for paper or ink supply, et cetera? Right, right. So that's, you know, the end goal. I, I you know, it's all about your angle because like, the end goal is always like, oh yeah, I just want free paper and ink, duh, right? But, but it doesn't really like work like that. Like it, it, I usually call my, spon my sponsorships like uh, partnerships yeah. because it's a cyclical relationship. You can't just like get ink. You know, I'm also sponsored by uh, FlexCut, which is a carving brand, you know? So that's why I have like 50 different carving tools, but definitely um it's all about your angle you know like what can you provide to that company and like what um because like i'm i'm always doing like demos i'm always um you know like on instagram filming my process uh filming the things that i'm using so that partnership really happened because i was already using their products right and then i was you know, most of the time, both of these companies actually reached out to me. So it's really, it's really not about like, you know, I wouldn't say it's all about like approaching companies, but it is about like increasing your visibility. Like that's what I did. Like I, for a while I wasn't taking Instagram specifically, you know, very seriously, but then I started posting like every day and making it a point to like post my process and post me just talking about whatever was on my mind that day or me, you know, some, something applying to like, you know, even just showing the studio, you know, or showing your workspace, you know, for the longest time, I, I didn't have any of those things. I didn't have a studio. I barely had like a clean table to work off of because I was living with family or friends or always moving like every couple months. So, you know, that kind of vagabond lifestyle and, uh, you know, not being able to be stable, but finding stability in a process, right? So that process was always, you know, recording and always like updating. And that's basically what kind of got me those things. And of course you want to reach out, you know, to certain companies just to make sure that they kind of like see you, but it's, it's not always going to work. You know, sometimes it's like right place at the right time. Sometimes it's like networking you know, it, it's just like this, like Sheila knew Amanda. So Amanda, you know, and this is how we were able to make this possible. It's, it's really about humbling yourself and, and knowing that there are hundreds and hundreds of artists probably working 10 times harder than you and, and, and just looking at yourself and being honest and, and how can I continue to just move forward? Because all those things are going to kind of like attract to you if you're being truthful to yourself you know so I don't know if that's any advice but that's kind of like the path that helped me achieve those things so wonderful I'm also just gonna we don't there are not tons of questions but a lot of comments but I, I just wanted to read this one at the very beginning when you were um talking about 
salvage materials. The sculpture teacher at our school said, thanks for both encouraging uh, salvaging materials and also doing so safely. <laughs> right? yeah. Wear your boots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, there's there's just so much that you can do, you know, with, it, it's like the, the old adage, like uh, one man's trash is another's treasure or whatever. Like, I mean, some of the most fruitful areas that I've found, you know, so many materials was actually the university, you know? So like, I just got back from a university of central Oklahoma and people are like, like I did a quick wood cut and, and people online are like, what wood are you using? And I'm like, I have no clue. The university's wood, it was one of the best that I've used, but you know, it's so interesting. Like even, you know, in pottery and ceramics, like you can make prints out of clay, you know, like to put on paper, but you can also use your woodcuts to stamp onto clay and then glaze them, you know, fire and glaze and all that to create tiles from woodcuts, you know? So it, it's all about like, tr you know, making connections with your, your work, regar regardless of medium, you know? There's so many people right around the corner in Miami that they're like sewing into arches and doing sun prints and then melding it onto porcelain. It's just like, you know, the material materiality of things and, and the overlapping, which we see in the real world, you know? Uh, when you walk outside your door, you don't say, well, this plant is part of biology. But actually, when I look up into the sky, that's, you know, a different sort of science. It's like all that stuff is happening at the same time. So. That's what I think is really interesting, particularly about college where we separate everything and then about the real world, you know? So the real world throws out a lot of real useful stuff <laughs> that you can reuse, you know? So that's kind of what I, oh. Yeah, yeah. especially that. in printmaking, some of the reasons that we have some of the processes is because they were needed for other things that had nothing to do with art. And we just were like, oh, we can use that. Mm -hmm. right? like yeah. if you think about it that way too yeah like engraving they would like engrave the sides of like you know metal or time pieces and rub ink and guess what now we have intaglio it's like where did that come from it's like the customer just dropped this off and we just needed to you know number their item and now you know we're now we're into a, electrolysis etching where you don't even have to use acid and it's so cool how you know printmaking continues to make strides into the future with, with such a traditional um, process so yeah it are there questions that people would like to state out loud to Jakob and of course now I'm like am I saying your name right <laughs> yeah you are okay <laughs> because you know your mom and your dad said it different. <laughs> well, I try to merge both of them. And it's like a, it, the pronunciation that I have is Yakub. Mm -hmm. but, but a lot of people forget the B. So it's like Yaku. <laughs> so it, it, it is a learning curve. But I mean, just like you said, the way I grew up, it's like, I even take Jake, you know? Hey, so, Jake. Uh, hey. <laughs> This is John Taylor. I was wondering, uh, I asked this in all carvers, how do you, how often and how do you sharpen your tools? So, um, well, I guess off the record, I don't do it that much. <laughs> <laughs> but for students, all the time, please. Do it all the time. <laughs> but, you know, I, I've, I've honed in um, on, on, on the practice enough where I can like kind of manipulate the carving tool on certain edges yeah. to, to, to do different lines and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I was in my earlier work, I was really on that V gouge, you know, I love the V gouge. Oh, so detailed, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, over time I actually morphed into like the U gouge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but, but I've noticed that at certain angles, um, you know, left, right, and up and down, I can create so many different lines. So just knowing, knowing that I, I don't really have to, you know, sharpen too often. Yeah. 
um, yeah. because I'm using so many different angles and areas of the tool. Yeah. But, but when I start noticing that, like, um, especially with MDF, things start like ripping weird. Yeah. Then I have my slip strop and I, I just quickly, I just do like, you know, 10 strokes on, on each side and then I turn it over and get the burr out. And then, uh, then it's good to go again. But I noticed uh, from other wood wood carver friends, they use a leather strop quite a bit, and mm -hmm. I I found that's very effective. Yeah, yeah, it's just a, le a leather piece, you know. Yeah. And um, but uh, and, and also an advantage that I have is that, you know, since flex cut has been so good to me, I've been and and speedball too. I've been able to just have a bunch of tools like in a bag. Sure. So, so I can like work with a tool and then kind of like set it aside and then work with another tool. Yeah. And that kind of like, you know, I expedite the process um, because they're so detailed. And like, even when I finish a piece in like two weeks, I'm like, that took forever. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, I, and then I set time aside, you know, clean the studio, sharpen all the tools and then, you know, kind of like, yeah. that process but yeah it, it was really wonderful when you were talking anything you said about printmaking especially failures amanda and sheila were just going yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> the real printmakers there yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're actually like like i said we're planning to all fail together <laughs> in august and september <laughs> excellent <laughs> no, but that's that's the most exciting part about this process is that my failures have actually contributed to things that I use daily now, you know, yeah, yeah. That, that I can't type into Google. Hey, you know, <laughs> what happened when I did this wrong and it came out amazing? You know, like you can't, you can't do that. Like there's no, like the handbooks that only show you, you know, they skim the surface. Then yeah. everything else is ad lib. It's like cooking or anything else. It's like, you could, we can never replicate grandma's cooking, right? <laughs> She, she put a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And then, wow, I did the same thing and it never tastes the same, you know? So it's all about finding our own flavor yeah. and the, our own way of doing things, you know? Like what you were saying, sometimes, you know, different people sharpen it all the time, you know? Yeah, and then yeah. people like me, I just, you know, as the tool gets dull, I, I move with that tool and right. kind of ad lib that, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh... Amanda and Sheila, who's the woman that, uh, I'm sorry, it's the, the woman that uh, carves uh, and she has uh, work at Greg Cusera a lot. Anyway. Oh, uh, you're, yeah, uh, you're talking about, uh, yes. She's anyway, uh, Jake, I, I talked to her and just said, how do you sharpen? She goes, Oh, I never do. I take them back to Pakistan when I visit, and I got a guy there. <laughs> well, who takes care of it? Yeah. Her name That's is Humaira Abid. Yes, yes. Oh, there. Okay. I, I want to um, kind of stop the um, recording, uh, and then we can kind of we can geek out as much as possible. Sure. Um, but if if um, you feel if anybody has a, a question that needs to be recorded, please let me know. Cool, thank you so much uh, for coming and thank you um, for spending your time with us.